Greetings and welcome to The Movement with Kemet Shockley and Kofi Lanyles. Thank you for joining us. This show highlights the most important voices in the current black movement for social justice. This is a chance for us to learn from the most insightful and impactful leaders in the community. Today we are here with Dr. Jared Ball, professor of communication studies at Morgan State University, who is known for founding I Mix What I Like, which is a multimedia hub of emancipatory journalism and revolutionary beat reporting. We are also joined with Omowali Africa, who is a Garveyite, a Pan-Africanist, and former president of Marcus Garvey's UNIA. He is an anti-violence advocate who is well known for his work as a community organizer. Omowali Africa, Dr. Ball, welcome to the movement. Dr. Ball, right now, we have a spate of police officers killing black people. We have black people killing other black people. The miseducation of black children in schools. Huge gaps when we compare black and white monetary household net worth. Disproportionate numbers of black people getting sick and dying from coronavirus. Meanwhile, there's an international movement being declared loudly that black lives do in fact matter here and all over the world. With everything that's happening domestically and internationally, Dr. Ball, I'm reminded of Marvin Gaye's 1971 song, What's Going On? As it pertains to black people, what is going on? Well, uh, unfortunately, what's going on is a continuation of uh, a set of relationships that obviously began with enslavement and co colonization here and across the diaspora. Uh, police violence, as Malcolm X said, is uh, done locally as the military performs its duties internationally, which is why in many ways we see um, not only police, but military violence being used against African pop populations here and across the diaspora, uh, and people responding, trying to still assert that black lives matter. Uh, the unfortunate reality is that the level of organization politically doesn't match the level of overt event planning, sloganeering, hashtagging, uh, and that's one reason why we haven't seen enough of a sufficient political response uh, throughout the diaspora to these conditions. And that's the next level of, of uh, struggle that I think we need to get to, to actually make the slogans turn into real material change, which is I know what people are trying to do, uh, but that is, uh, I think, the, the, the point of struggle that we find ourselves at right now. Omowale Africa, there is so much diversity in the black community. There are so many different ideas uh, related to what we should be doing to improve our situation. Often, some voices are left out of mainstream conversations related to the community. Now, you describe yourself as a Garveyite and a Pan-Africanist. I have three questions for you. One, what is a Garveyite? What is a Pan-Africanist? And what do they have to do with us being able to address real issues that are happening right now to black people? Yeah, so let me just answer, I guess, your second question first, right? To be a Pan-Africanist for me is really an umbrella term. Uh, what it basically means is that we as African people or people of African descent all over the globe um, are looking to work in tandem collectively to address the issues that we all face in common. Um, but under that umbrella of Pan-Africanism, you have various projects that have been carried out over the uh, decades. You have a Garveyite project, you have a socialist project, you have a neo-colonial project, a colonial and a capitalist project. So I always like to say that I'm a Garveyite Pan-Africanist or a Pan-African nationalist uh, because the particular project that I'm working to advance is the uh, development of a Pan-African nation on the African continent that is strong enough to protect the interests of Africans globally. Right, so um, how does that work uh, to address the issues that we face? Well, we as African people are being warred upon. Uh, we are under siege, and the only intelligent response to such a war is our collective unity, right? So Pan-Africanism and Garveyism uh, becomes the answer to the problem that we're, that we're facing collectively. Neither of you are what I might call mainstream thinkers. Um, I wanna show you an idea discussed by a black person who is a mainstream thinker. In this clip, Kamala Harris is explaining her idea. I don't want to discuss, I don't want to sort of focus on her issues as a politician. I find that personally less interesting anyway. But her idea, um, I wanted to ask you, Omawale Africa, Dr. Ball, just take a look at this and let's see what 
What's do you support reparations for black people? Well, listen, again, we had over 200 years of slavery. We had Jim Crow for almost a, a, a century. We had legalized discrimination, segregation, and now we have it, it, le segregation and discrimination that is not legal but still exists and is a barrier to progress. We have disparities around housing. We have disparities around education. We have disparities around income. And we have to recognize that everybody did not start out on an equal footing in this country. And in particular, black people have not. And so we have got to recognize that and do something about that and give folks a lift up. That's why, for example, I'm proposing the LIFT Act. Give people who are making $100,000 or less as a family a tax credit, which will benefit and uplift 60% of black families who are in poverty. So by default, it affects black families, but there's not a particular policy for African Americans that you would explore. But no, if you look at the, the reality of who will benefit from certain policies, when you take into account that they're not starting at, at, at the same place and they're not, stand, they're not starting on equal footing, it will directly benefit black children, black families, black homeowners. Because the disparities are so significant. So if we focus on the specific issues that have resulted in the greatest disparities, and we understand that that's part of why we're doing it. Listen, the, the reality also is this. Any policy that will benefit black people will benefit all of society. Let's be clear about that. Let's really be clear about that. So I'm not going to sit here and say, I'm going to do something that's only going to benefit black people. No, because whatever benefits that black family will benefit that community and society as a whole and the country. Omar Africa, your response to Kamala Harris. I believe that uh, Kamala is being uh, politically shrewd, so to speak. Um, reparations is something that is not legislatively uh, tenable. Um, reparations is also an issue that alienates a significant portion of the racist Democratic Party and Republican Party voter base. Uh, so the Democratic Party has always had this conundrum with their black voter. They need the black vote in order to secure the White House, but they're in a situation where if they do too much for the black voter, then they alienate their white voter. And for the past 40 to 50 years, the Democrats, you know, since Clinton, have been trying to regain that white voter that fled the party uh, in the 60s. So what you see there is Kamala, or Kamala, playing this game that Barack Obama advanced, this notion of uh, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats, right? But black people in this country don't have a boat. So in order for us to benefit from a, a rising tide, uh, this nation would first have to build us a boat. But every time we bring wood to the shores, whether we raise the money or the government gives us the money to, to, to put the wood on the shores, the government then comes and sets fire to that wood because they are ensuring that we will never have a boat. Uh, in this in this particular country, it makes perfect sense. But 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 even outside of that, the idea that there is no need for specific policies that affect Black people. What do you think of that idea in and of itself? That we don't need specific things for our community. For example, Afrocentric schools. Uh, we don't need specific uh, policies procedures for us. We can just we just have the same things that everybody else has? What do you think about that idea? Do we, do we, is that true or is that not, not really real? Well, it, it's certainly uh, not what the history shows, uh, nor is it what the studies show. Um, we, we have seen from history and the studies that have been commissioned by Congress and even the private studies that have been done by organizations like the NAACP, um, that black people have a specific need for redress. However, again, when it gets to that specific need and addressing that from a legislative perspective, it's impossible uh, to get it through. This was Du Bois's entire argument dur during uh, the Great Depression, which made him pivot and run towards nationalism. His argument was that he believed by presenting white folks with the data, by presenting white folks with the information, that eventually you could build this multiracial coalition that would act on, in the interest of black people, right, to give us our specific needs, right, that slavery and racism 
uh, th that would es essentially uh, repair us, right, from the acts of slavery and the continued racism that followed. Um, but Du Bois realized during the Great Depression that no such multiracial coalition would ever exist that would act uh, in the interest of black people. So therefore, black people needed to act in their own interest to develop their own institutions, right, that could protect them, that could feed them, that could house them, that could clothe them until America was ready to do so, right? And he said that based upon his analysis, he doesn't see that coming anytime in the future. He doesn't even see that coming in the next century or even two centuries from now. So you're saying that because the black community has been affected in specific kinds of ways, that we need specific kinds of solutions. Absolutely. I mean, this government has de designed specific policies to negatively affect the black community. So if you say that you want to address that negative impact, then you have to de uh, develop and design specific poli policies to, re to reverse that. Dr. Ball, what say you about Kamala Harris's idea? Well, first, I think it's important to note that even after eight years of a black president and now uh, at least a, a presumptive or hopeful uh, black female vice president, no one can actually say directly that, yes, we need policies specific to the conditions and histories of black people. So I think just that alone, her answer is very telling. Uh, uh, largely, I agree with what Brother Omawali said in terms of the legislative uh, uh, lack of hope. Um, but I think this is why, where I would argue that the follow-up that, that uh, Ms. Harris is offering is, is equally um, uh, insufficient in that the idea that we're going to give tax breaks to uh, a group of people that don't sit, uh, hit a certain household or a threshold of income is, uh, I, get under, I understand logically why you would want to broaden the umbrella so that you could get more, more hope, but, but more help legislatively. But if that's going to be the goal, which I think is, again, logical, uh, then let's broaden the umbrella of the pool of wealth being targeted. Namely, what I would argue is that rather than tax breaks for you know, people who don't hit a certain income threshold, let's target the pre-COVID at least $20 trillion GDP that we all contribute to generating in this country. What sparks so much fear is not just the direct address of the concerns of black people, what I think causes a lot of fear among those who hear uh, in white America and elsewhere of a call for reparations is that it threatens the, the general order of wealth creation and distribution in this country. It threatens the general capitalistic order of our country, which is what I think is, is uh, uh, in large part part of the response to, to why so many don't. Because if you go again logically in a descending scale, yes, black people certainly deserve a particular redress to a particular history. But you could also argue that so many other groups could make a certain a similar claim as they would in response to being asked to repair just the conditions of black people. Certainly indigenous people would have a claim. And even if you looked as a, as a grouping or as a class, uh, white laborers, could, you could argue, would have a claim for reparative justice given the history of this country. Uh, uh, but certainly when it comes to black people, we can't even get black politicians, or the most popular among them, to say aggressively that we do need something specific to black people. And I think that's one reason why we're not seeing any move in that direction. But yes, there certainly should be something uh, large in that direction done. When we talk about reparations, um, one of the most difficult problems that we have with this conversation is we have such, this, uh, such a narrow view uh, on reparations, especially as it pertains to uh, uh, black people. So I, I absolutely agree with Dr. Ball um, that two-thirds of you know the the electorate would never uh, legislatively support um, any uh, redistribution of wealth that is specifically targeted towards black people in this country. So the only thing that can truly address the the, the problems facing black people is that of power, right? Because from a power perspective, when, when you're discussing reparations, then it's no longer a moral question. It's more punitive, right? And typically, the only way to um, uh, enforce reparations from a punitive perspective is when you get someone to sue for peace, right? I've essentially defeated you in war, and as a result, in order to bring this to an end, these are my terms. Based on these terms, I would like this much in reparations to ensure that you can never become strong again to do what you once did before. But nothing short of power Right, will give black people the redress that we are currently looking for through, le through legislative means. This makes me think of the U.S. educational system. You are talking about knowledge of policy, knowledge of the electoral college. 
in ways that people need to think to actually understand what's happening around them. Dr. Ball, you suggested at early ages, black children are intellectually colonized. I find that to be very interesting. Can you help us understand what that means and the ways in which black children's minds are actually intellectually colonized? We have to, again, start with the intellectual colonization is part of a subset of a broader colonial process of conquering land, labor, resources, cultural expression, etc. Uh, so to maintain a system like that, you have to take over the, the, the control of the development of the, the intellectual capability of the people you mean to rule. Uh, the very field in which I'm professionally involved now, mass communication studies, is part of the U.S. imperial process uh, and is expressly discussed as such in the founding documents and early research that they are here to shape public opinion, to turn European immigrants into white Americans, to turn African descendants into Negroes, and to turn all of us into consumers. Uh, so this is, this is uh, to, to do that you have to begin very early. Uh, and as we know, the history of this country, whether it's the General Education Board uh, or industrial education for, for African descendants or residential education for the indigenous, it's all about snatching away the young, putting them in institutions, developing them, as was said of ind indigenous people, killing the Indian and saving the man, uh, to create these new identities, people that are more pliable and manageable. Uh, so this is, this is so, and then, you know, so anyway, so this is, and then more recently, even in terms of more modern history, the counterintelligence program explicitly stated, uh, as it's directed towards black America, the fifth tenet says specifically, we must make sure black youth don't become radical. So, uh, you know, of course, it's going to begin with an educational process, a media apparatus that targets young people with certain messages, et cetera. So, so that's part of what I mean, the, the, to, to prepare people to become part of the, the extraction process of, uh, again, of labor resource uh, uh, and even culture. Omowali Africa, you've been critical of the U.S. educational system and have suggested that black children are unjustly and systematically miseducated makes us wonder what constitutes a proper education for a black child and what steps must we take as a community to get there? I would argue that a proper education for a black child is, op is an education that prepares you for self-determination um, and self-actualization. Um, currently, as Dr. Ball stated, the education that we receive is education that fits us for domination. Right, so we go through a process of being systematically decapitated. 99% of black people in our generation, um, they swing somewhere from what I refer to as outright cooning to radical integration. This is why you have in a generation right now where people are celebrating um, John Lewis and this notion of good trouble. But when you actually understand the history and you understand the branch you know, that he comes off of, he represents a betrayal of where King was when King was assassinated, right? King, King died uh, uh, against Vietnam, against this uh, maldistribution of resources. Uh, Lewis died with his name affixed to the side of a, of, a, of a military vessel, right, that was meant to, you know, uh, ship bombers, you know, around the world, right? How, how do we gel those two things up? And the reason why that that can exist in people's minds without some type of dissonance is because of that acute spectrum, spectrum deprivation. They haven't been exposed to certain ideas where that would be an uncomfortable contradiction to wrestle with, right? So I think that that's where we are and, and the U.S. miseducation system is what gets us there. I think it's safe to say that it would be extremely difficult to remove all black children from U.S. public schools right now. According to the National Center for Educational Statistics, there are approximately 8 million black children in public schools. What type of education, it makes me circle back, what type of education are you advancing and do you think black children should receive? Should we be getting uh, a more radicalized and revolutionary education inside of public schools? Does that require separate institutions? How should we think about educating our children at the institutional level? So one, I would actually push back and say that it's not extremely difficult to remove uh, black children from public schools because we just saw COVID-19 did that overnight, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So it almost, um, it presents an opportunity for us to take control 
uh, over the education of our children. Now, I know that e economically it, it becomes difficult, right? I think that Karenga, uh, do uh, uh, Dr. Milana Karenga, um, states that in order to free the people, you must first free their labor, right? And the large reason why the majority of our people cannot, you know, take their uh, children out of the school is because the school operates as like babysitting so that you can work your eight hours or your 12 hours or your, your 16 hours, whatever you have to work in order to survive, right? So most people don't have the, um, aren't afforded the opportunity economically, right, to homeschool or to take their children outside of the school system. That being said, what type of education do we need? Well, we need education that ensure, education is meant to maintain your survival. Education is, is meant to ensure that you know the things that will allow you, your people, your culture to continue to survive and thrive on this planet. What that basically means is that any education that you receive as a black person that is teaching you to do that, when you're in a society that is looking to eradicate you, is by definition revolutionary and or radical because it goes against the interests of the society that is educating you in a way for your ultimate eradication or cleansing or for you not to be here, mm -hmm. right? So I think that when you're educating black people to be here and to be self-determining and to survive, then it puts us in direct conflict with those who want the complete opposite for us. And Dr. Ball, any thoughts on that? Sure, I mean, you know, well, the first thought I had was just to follow up on, on, on what Brother Omawale said. It's very true. You know, those of us, and I think I'm, I'm paraphrasing Ward Churchill here, but when you go to undergrad and you think you know everything, then you go to grad school and you realize you don't know anything, and then you get a PhD and you realize nobody knows anything. And I think that's, that's really, uh, anyway, that's my, my best approach to that. Um, on the one hand, I agree. I mean, COVID has given us a lot of lessons about what could and could not be done, although I, I I would slightly caution in that, you know, a lot of, while we had a lot of our kids removed from schools, for instance, uh, a lot of them just went to remote learning from those same institutions. So, so I get the, 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 the point being made that, you know, the physical break uh, can start, but then we would still have to develop other, inst you know, uh, institutional support for, for these students uh, to get that education that they need. I think initially that what we can be doing uh, because what we've also seen is that a lot of, I think to Brother Omawale's point, a lot of our people still need these institutions because their labor is not free and they need to go to these schools to get food, to get, you know, to, to put their kids somewhere when they have to go to work two, three, four jobs, et cetera, uh, even in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, so what I would just like to just re remind people are just some of the traditions that have existed, developing all, you know, uh, uh, extra institutional community-based schooling. I mean, there's a long tradition in, in African America for all of that. Uh, other communities certainly engage in that for their own benefit, uh, um, and we should be re revisiting that as well. And for parents watching, if I'm a parent at home and I'm thinking, what are the immediate steps I can take to improve the quality of education that my black child is receiving? This is to both of you. Can you give us one or two steps that a parent could take to, to start to address their child's educational needs? Well, one, I would say you could you could follow uh, uh, the trajectories politically and otherwise of either one of us, for instance, and you can find a great amount of, of educational materials online and other organizations that people could connect to. Uh, but there's, you know, for instance, there's a whole uh, African-centered network of education, uh, uh, um, uh, extra institutional educational networks that people could follow up on. Um, and programming, and even just individually, uh, we have, you know, things that we have to do on our own. We have to find different programming for our children. You know, there's, there, there are things that we can do uh, that, that should be done along those lines as well in the immediate. Uh, and then fo by following the logic in those materials and the people behind producing them, uh, they'll find a, 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 an entire world of uh, extra institutional uh, options that uh, just need more support and organization themselves. I would argue that um, you know parents need to do whatever they can to connect their children to the long history of who they are as a people mm -hmm. because the only thing that makes you fit for survival on this planet is knowledge of self and love of self um, and we've been stripped of, of those two elements um, as a people. Um, people who are self-determining that control their culture, that can control their cultural output and the socialization process, that's built in. Right, you're going to learn who you are. You're going to be equipped with all the uh, skill sets you need in order for your culture to transfer from generation to generation to ensure the continuity of your people. But when you, that, when you have been enslaved 
and you have been made into the object of someone else's development where they take you and say, okay, you are a creation that is only fit to be an input in this particular economy. Let it be slavery. Okay, well, we're going to transition. Let it be the industrial economy. Oh, we're going to transition. Now we're in this economy where we're questioning, okay, we don't really need this physical labor, but we have all these bodies, right? So now, you know, if the system is no longer educating you for the purpose of serving in its particular economy, then what is it educating you for? Conversation on education is, is just so interesting to me. It just makes me wonder, if we were to start to make headway in education, if there was a turn and the black community started to uh, get a handle on the education of its children, what could we expect from the government and the larger society so if, we were, if we were to? Because of course, having children, uh, having black children in the state of affairs they're in now maintains the status quo. That's the thing. You, you, it, there's not gonna be a change as long as that situation is the way it is. So what could we expect if we actually start to see successful takeover of the black community of the education of its children from government and from the larger society that we live in? Open aggression, increased surveillance. Um, there's a reason why during slavery, any gatherings of more than one or two, you had to have either a trusted Negro or you know, a white person present to observe what was occurring. As long as black people are doing the things that they expect us to do, then there's no concern. When they murder us and we march, that's perfectly fine. We can observe you when you're marching. Go ahead and you know, march your energy away. But if they murder black people and you don't see black people hit the street in anger, you see black people start to congregate and start to plan how do we deal with this situation, then there's going to be some real concern, right? Because it's like, well, what are those black people over there doing talking to themselves and by themselves? What are they talking about? that creates some concern, right? And you're gonna get aggression because that activity, any activity that black people pursue on their own that is self-determinant or even has an air of sovereignty is going to be demonized because that is not your role on this planet. White supremacy says that your role is to be uh, the burden bearer, the provider of labor, and the giver of resources, including your body. Well, that's, I mean, I, 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 Kwame Ture was right. I mean, the, the question of violence is not up to us. It's up to those who currently have power and whether or not they're going to relinquish it uh, peacefully or not, uh, you know. Uh, um, uh, but even again, at the even at the current discussion of mainstream two-party electoral politics. We're hearing uh, uh, responses of uh, threats of violence nationally if people just vote for one or two of the existing dominant electoral parties. So if that, again, is the threat for, for such a mainstream acceptable behavior, behavior, that is voting for one or two of the mainstream parties, then I think there is a logic behind what could be expected if you're actually attacking some, you know, more substantively some other element, which is again why the, the movement that does this has to again be multifaceted, has to be well organized and part of a broader, uh, hopefully international struggle. Now I talk to people just in the community and even at the level of the university and there's this thing now with being woke. So we talk about educating, we talk about education and educating oneself, and there's a movement to be woke, to become conscious. So it seems like now more than ever, and I could be wrong, that people are interested in information, interested in learning possibly about black history and culture, interested in politics. How does wokeness and consciousness play into the idea of being an informed community pushing towards power? For me, conscious, consciousness implies that you are consciously aware of what is happening, but you're consciously um, working to do something about it. This wokeness is more of, uh, I would argue, a pop culture fad that came about within the last maybe three to five years as a part of like the, the highest evolution of the hashtag activism. Um, but most of the people who refer to themselves as woke, I always jokingly state that there are various stages of sleep. There's, you know, deep sleep, light sleep, REM sleep, right? You go through phases of sleep before you're actually, once again, conscious. So most people who are arguing that they are woke is more like some type of like synthetic 
consciousness, right? Because it comes with like these prepackaged uh, terms and thoughts and ways of seeing the world, almost like a new morality that everybody gets and everybody agrees to like online. And if anybody questions it, like you're almost seen as like almost like a pariah or a heretic. Like why are you questioning our new religion, which is wokeness? So for me, I don't like to be referred to um, as woke. You can refer to me as someone who is centered or centric, right, being Afrocentric, but I kind of like reject the terminology of, of wokeness, that's me personally. Now I have to largely agree, especially when, you know, sort of parallel to the rise of woke was, is, is this uh, backlash against the, the concept of hotep, uh, you know, which for at least some of us, I would assume in this, in this gathering, has a different and more positive meaning. Uh, yet, so there's this, this balance of, or attempt to balance any tendency uh, that would exist with any oppressed community to 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 to, arise, to, to rise its consciousness uh, with this this demeaning uh, response to any effort that, that that seems to pop up doing it. And again, how is woke defined? I've seen it defined in any different number of different ways. And in fact, I was just talking about uh, with with uh, a class recently that the 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 new um, commercial media program series that I saw titled Woke had very interesting definitions of what, what, what that meant, uh, given where the, the lead characters ended up and with whom they ended up. And, uh, you know, I mean, you know, so I, I was trying to ask them, is this what it means to be woke? Uh, and and, and what, what are the parameters for, for being awakened? And I think, uh, I think the, the, the metaphor of different levels of sleep is perfect for that. So this whole tip idea, is this uh, evidence that the unconscious element of the community is becoming more aggressive, or is it just some backlash against those people who want to study and learn about the African heritage piece, or is it both? How do you see this whole Hotep piece that's, that we see arising? I think it's very easy to write it off as just kind of like plain vanilla, like Afrophobia, right? People are pretty much anti-African. We've been socialized to view anything that is um, you know, uh, being proud of being, like being proud of your Africanity is negative, right? That's just a part of our socialization for domination. Um, but on the other hand, I understand like the caricature of like this notion of Hotep. And, and typically, um, in, in a way, people who actually deploy the term Hotep, I almost see it as like um, a bit of elite, elite, elitism in the sense that it's typically people who are a bit more well-educated or traditionally educated within certain you know sectors of society and they deploy it against folks who are autodidacts or folks who are in the community who may only have access to YouTube scholars right and we know that on YouTube there is no uh, you know criteria or standard for scholarship it, it runs the gamut from complete ignorance to some of the most brilliant scholars that you'll ever find you understand what I'm saying so I think that when people levy the term hotep I understand where it comes from so it's difficult for me to take a position on it. Yeah, I have to agree. I mean, there's, it, it is a very complex issue, and I think there's a number of backlashes happening at the same time. On the one hand, there is the broad, the, the bigger backlash that is always ever present of, um, the, of state power, of elite, of the political elite, who are constantly needing to project uh, anti-revolutionary images to blunt the revolutionary fervor that is constantly being developed among oppressed communities. So, you know, once upon a time earlier in, for my generation, uh, the, the, the sort of natural rise of a, of, a, of a reconnection to Malcolm X was met with a state-sponsored commercial backlash to reappropriate Malcolm and put him safely back in, into commercial confines, where literally uh, Warner Brothers at the time was talking about pr uh, promoting Spike Lee's film uh, to, to create uh, Malcolm X as a brand akin to uh, Batman and the Simpsons. As more people ask more questions and start to reconnect to their radical traditions, we will see more attempts to commercially rebrand what all of those mean. So, of course, we're going to see a, a Disneyfication of Hotep, taking Hotep out of its African origin and putting it in, a, in a, you know, the Prince of Egypt to start with and, and, and promoting it forward into a caricature today. And then, of course, when you have a COINTELPRO movement wipe out a previous generation's radical uh, uh, organizations and leadership, we're left with a, 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 a you know a post-war effect 
where you do have an, an erasure of, 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 of organizations and leadership, but we're left with a lot of the, the YouTube scholars that Brother Omawale is talking about that, again, run the gamut from genius to something else. I love the depth and the contours of this conversation. It's very interesting. Um, I, I wanted to ask you to uh, both take a look at a brief clip of Yvette Carnell. And uh, before showing it, I'll tell you that there's been uh, some backlash against the notion of Pan-Africanism. Uh, but take a look and then we'll have some conversation afterwards. She says, in Kenya, racism was a concept that existed only in books and never in conversation. Tribalism is what we live with daily. Our identity was and is still ingrained in ethnicity, not skin color. It explains why most Africans experience being called black or African for the first time when they come to America. Listen, let me say that one time. You wanna call yourself African as an American in this country, but what this Kenyan immigrant is telling you is that the first time people who come from the continent get called African is when they get here. The first time they experience being black is when they get here. Because where they come from, everybody's black and nobody identifies by continent. People identify by country. So you are doing something in this Pan-Africanist stuff that even they're not doing on any, kind of, on any kind of macro level. Now I want somebody to tell me how this relates to us. Well, we did invite Ms. Carnell onto the show, but she did not respond. Omoale Africa, what is your response to her question what does this Pan-Africanism have to do with us? Well, I think it has everything to do with us because we uh, in America are an African people, right? We, we didn't just uh, pop up here, you know, on the shores of, of America. We were a part of a process that dispersed an African population all over this globe. Uh, so I think that the challenge, one of the biggest challenges that I have with Yvette Carnell is that it's this notion of gar garbage in, garbage out. So a lot of the inputs that she puts into her analysis to validate a particular claim are based upon garbage. What I basically mean by that is in no other tradition would you use someone who does not adhere to a tradition as the standard by which to assess a particular tradition. For an example, she uses an article um, of someone who is from the African continent um, and their view on Africanity or uh, black identity to basically state that Africans don't see themselves in this notion of Pan-Africanism. Well, that person was not a Pan-Africanist, right? So Pan-Africanism is a political um, idea. It's an objective. It's an aspiration. So why would you use someone who does not profess to be a Pan-Africanist or who may be even hostile towards Pan-Africanism as the uh, uh, yardstick by which you measure Pan-Africanism? And I think that she does these things purposefully because she wants to, or she wants her audience to arrive at a certain uh, conclusion. Um, I refer to Yvette Cardinal as Cortez. Uh, if you are familiar with the, the, the history of the conquistadors, right, the Spanish conquerors who attempted to come here and conquer North America, well, Cortez was a uh, general or soldier who arrived here on these shores after several uh, unsuccessful campaigns were waged. Now what Cortez did differently is once his men disembarked the ship, he said, okay, now toss a fire onto the ship. And what that basically means is that we're either going to win or we're going to die. There's going to be no other option for us to get to where we want to go. So what Yvette Carnell essentially did is when she came into the community, she tossed a fire into the ship of all other traditions within the black radical space. So Pan-Africanism, socialism, whatever you want to call it, if it's not aligning yourself with whiteness, um, if it's not aligning yourself with Americanness or American slavery um, as the path to uh, secure some type of reparation claim from this nation, then it needs to be burnt and it needs to be thrown away because this is our only path. Well, essentially, I mean, part of what allows uh, the, the ADOS uh, hashtag is described movement to thrive is because it parrots an old traditional conservative line. It's easily digestible in today's social, social media environment. 
uh, and is likely to resonate among, again, more the uh, centrist and conservative elements of the media and political environment. So there's going to be a lot of interest and support for it because, as was somewhat outlined already, uh, it is an anti-progressive, uh, anti-radical, anti-revolutionary, ideological, or political project. Uh, to start with, it, it moves against, again, as Brother Omawale pointed out, not just every radical or pan-African tradition within black American history, but within every black political project that has uh, claimed any sort of progress or advance, there has been an internationalist or pan-African element. So whether it's Garvey, whether it's Booker T. Washington, whether it's Du Bois, the three who are sort of always put up as the, the, the triumvirate of, of the, the, the dominant uh, you know, ideological spectrum, uh, um, all engage internationalist or pan-Africanist uh, projects. Uh, um, the mainstream civil rights movement had an internationalist pan-African aspect. Dr. King was at Kwame Nkrumah's uh, funeral. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, he was at his, well, at the funeral, but also at the, the, the uh, inauguration of the, the Ghanaian independence. Uh, you know, so we can go on and on. Of course, anti-enslavement uh, liberation movements, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, rebellions and resurrections all had internationalist components, uh, trying to connect the entire diaspora, if for no other reason, even if the idea is a sort of narrowly selfish black American focus, just tactically to cut oneself off from a potential international support network uh, is 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 uh, unsound in and of itself. Um, it also speaks against a lot of the other uh, traditions that are you know political but also cultural. Never mind even in commercial. I mean there are commercial networks of Pan African activity uh, that allow Black business to 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 benefit and thrive through its connections to a diaspora. So again, even on that level, um, just in terms of commerce, it's not it's not sound. No group. Not white Americans, nor any subset there within, or any other group has its sole uh, political destiny tied up with one entity. Even the United States and its political economic elite constantly uh, look to make deals and plans and arrangements with people, even with whom they don't agree or like much, you know, for their own well-being. So again, the idea that black America should cut itself off from an African diaspora or any other group and wed itself entirely to a white American project that is itself responsible for the negative conditions of black America is again illogical and unsound. Um, so again, and then just finally here, we, we even just saw it outlined methodologically, as Brother Omawale pointed out, her argument is unsound. I mean, it, it, it's, it's no more sound than were I to say, I'm a Pan-Africanist because I get along with my Gambian neighbor. Omawale Africa, you suggested that the system of white supremacy socializes black people into behaviors and habits of mind that could possibly put us in conflict with one another. I want to show you a video and then follow that up with a question. Yeah, I remember in high school is when like it was really a thing, like light skin this, that's light skin like, that. That's yeah, when yeah. the word was introduced to me because yeah. even before that I didn't even talk about light skin. Yeah, I was, I was like, you know, light skin had their spread, like, oh yeah, she's light skin, she's automatically beautiful. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that sort of thing. And then for people, and I remember for myself, how did I feel? Um, I didn't really, I don't think like it really affected me that much. Like I felt like it was just like, whatever people are gonna say, what they're gonna say. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I guess it was kind of annoying. I don't want to say annoying, but like it, would, it was very common to hear guys say like, no, I didn't want to date a light skinned girl. Like only light skins. Mm -hmm. Like I don't want to talk to a light skin. Like I don't like dark skinned girls. You know what I mean? Yeah. But the fact that we're even, separating ourselves and categories, categorizing people into light skin, dark skin, brown skin. Yeah, it's really messed up because at the end of the day, we're all black, Yeah, different shades of brown. But um, yeah, for high school, for me, I heard you experienced a lot of like light skin hate, no? Yeah. It's literally just like, oh yeah, because like, obviously, like in the time, the guys are like, oh, light skin curly hair, oh, there's a new girl, light skin curly hair, and then girls that are like, Throwing shade, like, oh, I don't like her because blah, blah, yeah. blah, but they had no reason to like not like you, Tiffany. And I feel like there's this new wave too happening where it's like, I don't know, I find personally, I don't hear so much like light skin, dark skin as much as it was. But yeah, for in like in my environment now, I just don't really see it as much. And I see that there's like been like this push of 
more like, oh, melanin, like appreciate the melanin. So first and foremost, what I would want to say is um, I absolutely do not want to um, negate anything that the sisters were saying. To answer your initial question about manufacturing this particular conflict between black men and black women and what uh, role does that play uh, within the context of white supremacy, um, it, it's very um, simple. The goal for white supremacy um, is to use the resource of black labor use the resource of black intelligence, right, until it is depleted and then to be cast away. So we're in a situation as a people, um, as I stated many times throughout this conversation, where black people in this country represent a superfluous population. Um, one of the ways in which uh, you can help to eliminate a population um, over time, right, and I did an entire lecture on this um, where I started by referencing, refer, referencing um, Thomas Malthus's essay that was written in 1797. Um, and in this essay, he has a statement where he says that left unchecked, populations grow, right? This is the, the natural growth patterns, right? If we don't do anything to prevent a population from growing or if the natural checks and balances of nature, a population is going to grow. So when you see that the black population in America is being maintained over a century, 10%, 11%, 10%, 11%, it's not growing, then we know that there's something at play that is checking um, that particular population from growing. And unfortunately, the way that white supremacy works is we tend to like what our oppressors like, and we tend to hate what our oppressors hate. So if our oppressors view darker-skinned black people, or darker skinned black men as ugly, then we think that they are ugly. But if they view darker skinned black men as attractive, right, or as sex symbols, then we see the same thing. So you see this shift occurring, and then by the 1980s, it's fully, you know, I'll be sure is out of here, and Denzel Washington is in, right? That shift has never really occurred for black women, you know, the way that it's occurred for black men. So these notions of how we see each other um, and the conflict that we have towards one another is something that is baked in in our socialization process that's meant to keep us at odds so that ultimately we stop reproducing with one another. That's the goal. Dr. Ball, any response? The bigger problem with these conversations is the context in which they take place, which seems to often be in a commercial media space devoid of, of radical or any kind of organizational politics and outside of conversations about white supremacy, capitalism, et cetera. Uh, and often leaves the conversation. I know this is not the, the overall point, and, and it's not to dis, again to diminish, diminish uh, the struggles of these uh, particularly darker-skinned black women. But it often ends up taking the, the, the tone and the tenor and the the, the 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 approach of condemning black men or celebrity black men or particular black men in the choices of, of uh, their mate, uh, which I think again, you know. So we end up having a lot of anecdotal conversations, like the ones in the clip there. They're not, they don't, they're not matched with any data. They're not matched with any sort of uh, radical analysis. And then again, when it's not discussed in the context of what are causing whatever is going on, and it's just left with, again, anecdotal experiences, uh, we, we're not advancing anywhere. Um, any of us can pick anecdotal experiences and extrapolate any kind of form of conclusion um, but it doesn't. It, it, I don't think it's sound, and I don't think it's very helpful. So yes, there of course is color. There of course there are issues of colorism that exist as a response, or as a as a remnant, or as a as an encouraged response to the systems that we find ourselves in. Uh, but I'm, I'm I think that the the, the discussions are, are are often themselves woeful. Again, just lastly, I mean they they take place often in these commercial media environments that off, also often never show positive experiences of black couples, particularly dark-skinned black couples, for communities to, to emulate. So it seems extraordinarily hypocritical that these same media spaces would then want to come back and talk about all the ravages and the negative impact uh, uh, on black communities and never you know, talk about their complicity in it. Dr. Ball, can you help us understand the movement and provide insights into what is happening now? Well, I think that uh, we are at a, uh, one of the more difficult moments in uh, 
maybe in you know modern human history in terms of political struggle, in, at least in this country, in that I think we're at a, a given the the uh, arrangement of media, uh, its pervasiveness, uh, its consolidation and ownership, um, and the horrific conditions that are being imposed on most of the people in this country. We're seeing a moment that I, that I'm characterizing at least as best I can as a, as a point in time where we can have any issue or story covered and discussed popularly. But the sophisticated nature of American propaganda has reorganized itself in such a way that those discussions are, are, are presented in very slick, comfortable, palatable ways with massive limitations put on the ranges of ideas and thought that we're allowed to deal with. And I think it's creating a, a, a reverberating uh, echo chamber of, of confusion, uh, uh, aided by, of course, the fact that we are in this, as I was describing a moment ago, this sort of post-black liberation struggle war moment of massive disorganization, uh, dislocation of our organizations, assassinations, still the political exile. Brother Omawale mentioned Asada Shakur, she's still in exile with her bounty increased under the previous black president with the black head of the FBI and a black attorney general. Um, meanwhile, people in the streets are wearing shirts that say Asada taught me, while recently released uh, political prisoner Jaleel Muntakin, a comrade of, of Asada Shakur, is asking of them, if Asada is teaching you, what lessons are you learning? Because your activism doesn't match the politics and the ideas that she represented in her struggle. Mm -hmm. And what is the relationship between your work in the current movement? Well, all of my work as an adult, as a journalist, as an academic, as an activist, has been about trying to build those grassroots uh, elements uh, and support them and advocate for a, a re-engagement with all those radical traditions. What is your definition of the movement and can you provide insights into what's happening now? And then follow that up by telling us about your work and how it's connected to the current black movement. I would define a movement uh, as an organized formation of multiple entities that are aggressively pursuing a common agenda or a common goal. Um, and what we have today, I wouldn't argue, is, is a movement. I think we see like a, a lots of emotion-based mobilization, but not really um, organization or true movement, right? When we look back at um, the, the previous iteration of the movement, there were a plethora of organizations that house the different ideological positions that exist within the black community, right? So you had everything from, you know, your SNCC, your SELC, your CORE, your NAACP, you had your Panthers, you had your RAM, you had your, um, your um, New African People's Organization, right? You have a, a plethora of organizations that are meant to organize the masses and in a structured manner point us and march us in a certain direction. What we have today, right, that organizational apparatus is missing. What you see is this new non-for-profit kind of like apparatus has replaced that grassroots apparatus that once existed. Um, and you have veterans of the non-for-profit industry or the white ally industrial complex that now occupy space, um, which used to be occupied by movement builders in our community. We no longer have movement builders. We have a generation of brand builders. So everyone wants to build their brand as a revolutionary. You know, we want to be on the front cover of Vogue with our, our fist in the air. You know, we want to be speaking at $30,000 engagements that are sponsored by Wells Fargo. That's not a true movement. So in terms of my work, my work is in two areas. My, my work is in increasing political clarity um, and in building the infrastructure capacity so that we can have true movement. Right, so working to build organization, but also expand uh, the scope of what organizations do. And Dr. Ball, I want to pose to you a question. If black people follow your lead, become anti-colonialist, revolutionaries, what does that look like and where do we find ourselves in 10, 20 years from now if we follow your lead? If, if that general trajectory were, were followed, I think we would at minimum see a heightened level of struggle in, across all, for, all, all areas. And that's ultimately what I would like to see. I don't have a particular um, singular approach or program that I would argue is gonna be the single bullet solution. I think that, that somewhat similar to what Brother Omawale was saying, that movements are multifaceted, they're multi-elemental. 
uh, and they require a lot of people being involved in a lot of different ideas than the current ones were, that are, were currently operating under uh, uh, to, to be uh, exposed and uh, exchanged and, and considered. So that's really what it would be. So it would be heightened levels of struggle all across the board. There would be massive more involvement in grassroots political organization. There would be a, a, a great migration offline uh, and away from brand management, uh, to, to, to the brother's point again. Uh, there would be, again, there would be, if, if people were dealing with voting, there would be a, a wildly radical platform and in, in re, a reorganization and rearrangement and re-engagement that had nothing to do with the two existing dominant parties. Um, and, uh, uh, and in some ways, there would be a, 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 a quieting. Uh, as many people left public performance and went into actual organization building, uh, and from that would become something that uh, I can only fantasize and dream about, which I do every day. On Wale Africa, if black people follow your lead or your line of thinking, and we begin to see ourselves as Pan-Africanists and we are culturally centered, uh, what does that look like in 10, 20 years? What does that look like for us? Well, if we start now, and I would argue that the focus has to be um, political education and preparation for political disintegration, right? As this society is collapsing around us, black people, or all people, but I'm more, I'm race first, so I'm more so concerned about black people, have to be prepared to exist in a world that looks radically different from the world that we exist in today. Right, the white militias, they are preparing. They are preparing for you not to be able to feed yourself, so they're preparing to gun you down. What are we preparing for in this new world? Right, so again, it goes back to assessing our situation, um, not uh, basing our actions on some type of delusional hope for a world that will never exist, but really being a, a, a realist. I don't know if you call it a racial realist, whatever you want to call it, but really looking your situation square in the eye and addressing it as it stands and preparing for that reality that we all know is coming. Dr. Jared Ball, Omawale Africa, thank you so much for being our guests on The Movement. Thank you for having me. To Dr. Jared Ball in Omawale Africa, thank you for joining us on The Movement with Kim and Kofi. And to you, the viewer, remember to follow us on Facebook at The Movement with Kim and Kofi. Join us next time on The Movement.